Thank you and good morning to everyone. I'm delighted to be here. At last I've been looking forward to this for a few months since uh, hearing we had the chance to uh, come and speak here. And uh, I think, you know, you called it net neutrality and privacy. I think I, I told Alan and the others that I wasn't going to focus so much on uh, net neutrality and privacy, but rather frame it in the wider context of governance of the internet uh, and governance on the internet and talk a bit about the, the wider uh, discussions and the wider developments in um, the global governance of these issues uh, of internet policy and internet governance. And so I think it's useful when uh, we consider this to look back at the history of technology a bit to get a feel for the, the scale of what's been happening. Radio took 38 years to reach 50 million users. Television took 13 years. It's not bad. And the internet took four years to reach 50 million people, which is quite amazing when you think about, about that. And today, we have close to 3 billion users of the internet. And I'm not even talking about the devices that are increasingly connected to the internet. That add, add a few more billions and soon 50 billion, if you, if you believe some uh, estimates. So it's no wonder, in, in the face of this rapid growth, that the internet has attracted so much interest. Uh, interest from all of us as individuals, because the internet touches on uh, our everyday private lives increasingly. And of course our economies, our societies have been increasingly uh, shaped or, or, or enabled by the internet. And so, um, politically, at, at global level, we saw a rapid increase in the interest for ICTs and, and in particular, the internet over the past 15 years or so. Um, and actually, 2015 marks 10 years since uh, the conclusion of a UN World Summit on the Information Society, WUSIS, or WSIS. And uh, that was one of the, the most notable manifestations of that, that growing interest um, in the internet. And that summit produced a number of, of documents, um, the Tunis Agenda, the Geneva Declaration, which was in, in two phases over four or five years, which covered a broad, very broad range of topics uh, to do with IT, telecoms, and the internet. And in fact, the summit initially was very much supposed to be about bridging the digital divide, developing countries that were saying that we just don't have enough uh, connectivity and therefore. Uh, we are further slipping down economically and socially compared to the developed world. But it, quite rapidly within that summit, the discussion started, as they often do in UN settings, to be a bit more on the political side rather than the, the economic or technical side. And people started to ask, well, who rules the internet? How can it be controlled? I imagine a bunch of governments talking about this, and, and I was a civil servant at the time and negotiating this, under the uh, Irish presidency of the EU, actually, at one point. Um, and uh, so it, it was interesting discussions, you know, how can we control this as government? Who, who is the boss? And the problem was that there was no clear conclusion on that. And there still isn't, because no one governs the internet as such. In fact, the, the, the running the core functions of the internet is coordinated rather than govern. Coordinative is, is, is a better word. And it's coordinated by a very distributed, collaborative uh, ecosystem. Different organizations, different processes, mechanisms, and people that each have distinct remits, whether it's uh, uh, organizations, for instance, that develop internet standards, like the Internet Engineering Task Force, or the World Wide Web Consortium that develops standards for websites, or it's ICANN, which we'll talk about in a minute, which looks more at uh, IP numbers and the domain name system, or indeed it's uh, international organizations, uh, for instance the ITU looking at telecom infrastructure, or governments themselves, or the EU in some of these areas. So we can, in the Q&A se session, for instance, if you want to talk in more detail about net neutrality and privacy, I'd be more than happy to, to go on that. We can talk, and there's a lot of activity at, uh, at the EU level on that. So it's a, it's, it might feel nebulous, but in fact it's something that works quite well, because we have a distributed system that makes a whole uh, <coughs> stronger. You, you, you have uh, fewer critical points of failure, if you will. Um, uh, one of the reasons that we have this highly distributed system is it comes from the organic way in which the internet grew. Uh, and also because of the, the nature, the cross-border nature of the internet. It's inherently cross-border. So you can't really have a traditional system 
of governance that is dominated by governments that are bound by nation-state boundaries. You have to have a construct which enables decisions to be taken at global level uh, in a fluid manner. Plus, you don't have governments as those kind of ubiquitous actors that dominate this whole value chain. You have a flurry of different actors that have an important role in this value chain from you know, peering exchanges that centralize uh, some of the, the, the connectivity to uh, internet service providers to users themselves, of course. Very important elements of this, this value chain. They, to a large extent, we, <laughs> users, have driven a lot of the development of the internet, thankfully, uh, I would say. And governments, of course, have got their own remit and powers and, and, and interests. So it's really a, a collective in that sense. And that governance of the internet very much grew from how the internet was developed, which was that in the, the, the late 60s, you had a bunch of universities, mainly in the US, and funded by the US Department of Defense, as, as they do, because they fund a lot of fun things. And um, the main, or probably the leading team, uh, was at the University of California in Los Angeles at the time. And they had pioneered a concept, and they were about to launch it. And before launching it, they thought, hold on, maybe we haven't got this all very right. By the way, I'm completely departing from my script, so <laughs> pardon me. <laughs> uh, but I think it's just useful to look at, that, at how it grew. And they had this concept, of we know there's other teams that are working on very similar projects to create a new, very resilient means or network of communications. Let's test our idea. Let's make sure that we're, we're on the right path. So rather than just compete each in our own ivory tower, let's just share, do a bit of peer review effectively, a bit like in, in normal academia or scientific research, and try and get to a better uh, solution. And so they issued something that they called the Request for Comments, an RFC, which was basically a concept paper and they sent it out to universities like University of Maryland and a few others that were working on similar projects to try and get feedback. And they got feedback and the uh, ARPANET, as it was now then known, uh, was created in about 1968. And that way of working, that collaborative way of working, of developing technology and making sure that it sort of worked and they could develop protocols that could talk to each other, um, grew into the sort of governance that we have today which is that, for instance, in the standards world, we have this Internet Engineering Task Force, which I referred to. When they agree a standard, the name for the standard is still called an RFC, a request for comment, uh, C5098 or whatever. Um, and it's all developed from the bottom up, i.e. anyone can come up with an idea and discuss it collaboratively with others, and then it's agreed by consensus. You don't vote, you don't have a central authority that tells you yay or nay, you agree by consensus, and usually if you do that, you have all this collective brain power, different perspectives that come together to end up with a better result, a result that can work for everyone rather than just from the diktat of one entity that might have missed uh, a particular angle. And we find ourselves with a very similar model, what we've called now the multi-stakeholder model, in the way we govern a lot of what happens um, on the internet, on the, on the architectural uh, side of the internet, very much the, the core plumbing, if you will, of the internet, which is in our case, and I can, the domain name system and the IP numbers, but I've also mentioned already standards, for instance. It's all done very much in this bottom up collaborative multi stakeholder way, where initially you had scientists with a few US government officials at the back because they were financing the whole thing, and then little by little more academics came in, and then more international because. Um, international interest grew and others connected to the network and then little by little other governments came in and then representatives of the user community etc. That's the model we have today. So it's a very different model of governance from the traditional sort of Westphalian type of, um, of model and I will try now to go back to my script uh, to, to continue the flow although it's all related and if there's a problem with passwords uh, uh, sorry about this um, and touch keyboards. Um, now, I think it's useful to just think about where we're at in terms of this internet, I'm sure. So, let, let me just mention maybe, maybe how it works within ICANN to give you a, a bit more of a concrete where, uh, example of how multi stakeholder governance works and what we do. So, at ICANN, what we do is to, our mission is to manage worldwide internet resources. And when we say internet resources, it's specifically the domain names, so .ie, .com, etc. 
IP addresses which are attached to each device connected to the internet and the underlying internet parameters, basically uh, about a hundred or so tec very technical standards that explain how you effectively receive a certain type of file, so for instance how an MP4 file might be sent and how the protocol accepts it, that sort of thing. And that has to be globally coordinated. For a very simple reason, we all need unique identifiers. So in practice, how, and I'm going to simplify this, the job we do is to enable, is, is enables a very simple thing. You're opening your computer, you open your browser, you type www. I took the example of IDA.ie earlier, and your computer will send a message that will query a global database that will find the one computer, the one device that actually is the IDA.ie on that particular web page on that site, to continue that example. And there should be only one. Because otherwise, you could end up in well, IDA. Well, I don't know the Korean equivalent or any other. So we need to have unique identifiers, and of course, there's billions of those. So we need a system that uh, enables rapid growth uh, in a number of, of users or connected devices, and that enables that resiliency. We need to make sure that uh, you can send as many queries to the internet as as you want, uh, as many users as we have, and it doesn't fail. And that system hasn't failed. It's grown to close to 3 billion users, and we've never had a failure of the domain name system. And we still have, uh, well, there's still a few challenges, but we have, we have numbers uh, that work, and we still have unique identifiers globally to find any other device anywhere in the world. The way it works within ICANN is that all the decisions to do with, for instance, adding a new domain name or changing certain parameters are done by this multi-stakeholder model. So we have structures dedicated to uh, each of the main stakeholder groups and then some structures which are cross stakeholder groups. So for instance we have a government advisory committee where all the governments sit in and they can talk about any subject to do with the domain name system. And we have a dedicated resiliency and security committee and then we have uh, one which is specifically about generic top level domain names like .com. So if any new policies, for instance uh, consumer protections need to be attached for any reason to uh, those types of domain names gets discussed within that. And within that particular structure, we don't just have one set of stakeholders. We have the registry, the people that actually operate, uh, for instance, .ie or .com. We also have the registrars, which are the entities that sell the domain names. But we also have what a wider business community, ISPs, for instance, but not just. We have, for instance, the head of the, the business constituency at the moment is, I think, from HSBC in the UK because they have new domain names and because they're interested in inter intellectual property protection at that level. So we have a wider constituency there. And we also have civil society and academia. And all of these groupings actually each have their own representatives on the overall board of ICANN. So we try to have a structure which enables that uh, sort of cross-functionalization of ideas, brings those people around the table, again, bottom-up, any of these constituent stakeholders can bring up an idea and discuss it with the others and it gets agreed by consensus. That's how policies and procedures are uh, agreed with ICANN. So we've launched uh, a couple of years ago a whole new program of, of, of so-called new GTLDs, new domain names. So um, you, know, you might have uh, .london is one of the big new ones. Uh, there's things like .guru or .club which are quite successful. And all the procedures for uh, designing that program and the protections attached to them were devised by this range of stakeholders, which doesn't come with, it's not easy all the time, uh, it's still not easy, um, but that, that's how it works. And what we find is that rather than slowing down the processes, what it enables us to do is speed them up because we have people around the table. Objections can be raised earlier. If something doesn't work, the technical guys will tell us. If something breaches freedom of expression, the NGOs will shout. If something could help cyber criminals, we have law enforcement that's around the table as well. And they know how to be around the table. Um, so that's, that's probably how it works. And then what we find is that the, the overall approach, it, it maximizes the Internet's creative potential. It just opens up avenues for uh, both innovation, but also enhancing the resilience of the system. It facilitates cooperation, but without over-centralization. So you have global coordination, but it's not so centralized that it's uh, over bulky, if you will. And it embraces globalization because it's a system that inherently can look beyond national borders because we have representatives from all over the world. Um, 
Uh, and at the same time, because we try to build into that multi-stakeholder model ways of representativity and, and balance, it brings in uh, accountability and inclusiveness in, in, in how, uh, how the, this basic architecture of the internet is governed. Now, it's a model that's worked well. It hasn't failed. It's grown, as I've mentioned the numbers already, I think. You know, ICANN was formed in, in 1998. I can, I can come back to, to its creation. Uh, there were about 150 million users then, well, close to 3 billion users. It's an enormously rapid growth, and yet the underlying system has worked. You've always been able to find someone, at least our own part of it. Your ISP might have had a problem, I don't know. But uh, at the very basic global level, we've had enough numbers, we've had enough domain names, and it's grown well. But it's still fresh, it's a new model, it's a pioneering model which has evolved because that it is to be a novel approach to governing in this, in this cross-border environment. So it's not perfect, it's, it's very pioneering, it's a laboratory, if you want, in a, in a new way of governing, which I think from a, an international relations or foreign policy perspective is, is quite interesting. I, I think it's a model that deserves to be looked at, not just in the internet context, but probably more widely, when we face so many uh, cross-border challenges, uh, transnational networks that are created that we can't completely uh, comprehend very well, whether we're talking about for instance, transnational terrorist networks or others, um, there might need to be new ways of, of governing in, in, in our age. And I think it's an interesting model to look at. But it's not perfect. It's, it's growing, it's maturing, uh, a bit like the Internet itself. I mean, if we think about it, the Internet became public only about 25 years ago. Um, and uh, it's still very, very young. There's much more happening. Um, and clearly, I think there, there's a lot of worries, and that's where... We could talk about all the tensions that are happening at the moment, tensions over privacy, uh, our personal personal privacy, or tensions about the protection of data, whether our data or organizational data, cyber threats of all kinds, uh, you know, online censorship, uh, many examples of those, uh, especially recently, and the challenges that are posed by the digital world to the traditional industries are struggling, or some of them are struggling to adapt. And then, you know, for others, you know, the dominance of a handful of giant internet companies uh, scares them. Maybe not, not so much in Ireland, but certainly where I come from. They're really worried about this. Um, sometimes there's worries about the tax situation of those companies, uh, conveniently forgetting about the fact that it's not just this sector that's trying to minimize their tax. But anyway, that's a completely different story. Uh, and then, of course, you know, it goes all the way to, you know, the geopolitical power plays which are reflected, mirrored in the online world. We see the very same dynamics in internet governance discussions as we see in international politics at the moment. I'm happy to go into detail on that on, on Q&A, but you can just imagine uh, what the would-be superpowers of this world are trying to do in the internet governance world. They are trying to have their say and control the system as, as much as they can uh, for their own purposes, mirroring what they might be doing on the ground uh, in uh, in, in certain countries or in UN settings. And with all these kind of worries, these tensions, and this increasing interest in the internet in mind, uh, it's interesting to see that we're, we're really at a juncture in the internet. Uh, I think it's really coming of age, it's maturing, it's not a child anymore, it's maybe still an adolescent. Uh, I like to think about the adolescent, you know, full of doubts, full of hope, um, but also a bit of, of uh, wickedness sometimes, perhaps. Um, and there's a lot of evolution happening. Um, last year in April, we saw one of the first manifestations of that, that change with the president of Brazil, Dilma Rousseff, who had been rather outraged by the uh, mass surveillance issue, organizing a global conference, a global multi-stakeholder conference on the future of the internet. That was nicknamed the Net Mundial Conference. It was in April last year in Sao Paulo and gathered, uh, I think there were a couple of thousand people, and uh, there, there were people truly from every part of the world, and from a lot of governments, and from civil society, and from business, etc., etc., and they came up, by consensus, with uh, a set of principles uh, for governance of the internet internationally, which started up with human rights and privacy, went through a whole list of other considerations on innovation, competition, etc. And also a roadmap for the evolution of internet governance, which included a number of areas. Um, for instance, the need to tackle cybersecurity, the need to look at net neutrality without concluding on it. 
uh, the need for eye care and concern to evolve, um, and a, a raft of other things. So uh, let me just say a couple of words on what's happening uh, with ICANN, if I may, uh, both because this is very topical for ICANN as an organization, it's worth knowing about, and because it will have a direct relevance to Ireland very soon. I'll mention that at the end. Uh, or maybe some of you might know. Anyone knows what it will have a relevance for Ireland? Barry, you don't say it. Okay, we'll see later. Okay. Uh, I mean, it has direct relevance for Ireland anyway, but it's got a, spe a particular relevance for the Hero Bandit. So, the evolution that's happening within ICANN is, is quite a, an important one, but mainly a symbolic one, which is that I mentioned earlier that the US government's um, Department of Defense um, had funded uh, all these projects that, uh, that matured into what was then called ARPANET and then became the Internet. And they kept, they, the US government, kept a link with all this, this organization, an overall oversight, just to make sure things were run well. What happened up to the mid-90s is that if you wanted to, for instance, create a new domain name or add a new country code, uh, for instance, I know the case in France, it was 1984, uh, the French Research Institute for Computing is called INRIA, and they wanted to operate the .fr domain name. So they contacted a professor at the University of uh, California called John Postel, who was one of the professors who had been in the original team that created the internet. And John was the guy in charge of managing the directory of domain names, that directory that you go back to. And uh, there was an RFC that he had co-authored in the ITF that explained what were the conditions for operating a, a, a domain name extension uh, and a country code in this particular case. He, John, checked and said, yeah, okay, this looks like a bona fide uh, institute and they look decent and they will promise to abide by certain quality standards in terms of the service delivery. Fine, they can operate .fr. And basically, John was in charge on his own, pretty much, with I think a couple of graduate interns, of running this whole directory until 1997, when both his university, which by the time, uh, the funny thing is that he moved to the University of Southern California, and the whole role moved with him. Uh, and he still had the US government at the back. He still had to check all the changes with the US government. Say, so, by the way, I've got this, for instance, in RIA came in and they want to operate .fr, followed all the procedures. He said, okay, and the US government would say, yeah, that's fine. And by the way, they never said no to any of the requests in, in 30 odd years. Um, so he moved to the US of Southern California, and that university, together with the US administration at the time, said, look, look, this is the mid 90s, you know, the internet's really taking off. We need some, something more sustainable than just John, however nice he is. I mean, I don't know if it's the fact that he was a bit of a hippie with long hair and beard, but they said we need something more sustainable. So the Clinton administration decided to set up a, a small task force. And that was headed up by, by Al Gore officially and someone called uh, Ira Magazina, who was Clinton's technology advisor. And they created a structure that was ICANN, effectively, and in particular to administer functions that were called IANA, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, which is basically has got three main uh, remits. One is to manage the directory of domain names. One is to manage the global pool of IP addresses that are allocated to all computers uh, connected to the internet, and uh, the other to officially sort of uh, uh, rubber stamp, if you will, the protocol parameters agreed by the Internet Engineering Task Force to support technically the, 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 this um, this setup. And so it was replacing John by this INA function, if you will, and ensuring that there was an organisation I can behind it that could. Uh, run this. But the US government decided to uh, keep uh, a tab on it, basically saying, look, we create ICANN, but um, we'll keep an oversight, especially on these core INF functions, for a while. And in a couple of years, once it's up and running, we'll just go away. And if you look, there's a white paper published in 98 by the Clinton administration on this, which said, we'll create ICANN, and I can't remember if they gave a date, but I think they said within two years, we'll exit. And then nothing happened. Um, yeah, lots, lots of discussions. There was this world summit happening. The U.S. was still in charge. Bush administration by then. You make your own conclusions. Um, then the U.S. kept that historical link. Um, now, well, uh, Obama's administration comes in, and uh, in March last year, they finally announced that they intended to transition this historical oversight role 
to what they term the global multi-stakeholder community. So they tasked us, I can, to convene uh, basically a consultative process. And um, that led to the creation of two parallel processes with dedicated working groups. One is a process uh, led by a group called the INS Stewardship Transition Coordination Group, the ICG. We're very, very good at acronyms. Um, I can, uh, we've got 250, I think, that I can share with you if you want. Um, so the, this, there's this process, which is the, the main one, basically saying, OK, if we don't have this US government oversight to keep a tab on how the, the, the changes are made to these crucial directories, effectively, how will this multi-stakeholder community uh, be able to check that things are being done properly, and if they're not being done properly, to redress that. And so there's been a series of consultations, it's still happening at the moment, and then there's a parallel track that started soon after, because a lot of people were saying, well, okay, well, if ICANN is still in charge of running all this, whatever oversight mechanism will create, will ICANN as a, as a structure, as an organization, have the relevant and the right checks and balances, basically the good governance mechanisms in place so that indeed we can exercise that oversight properly. You know, if we think that, the, for instance, the Board of ICANN takes a decision which is contrary to our, uh, our you know, the global community's interests, can we overrule them? So there's that parallel track on uh, called Enhancing ICANN Accountability and Governance, which started in well, in the second half of last year. So these two are running concurrently. There's been actually quite a bit of progress, and uh, I think a lot of us have been very pleasantly surprised, because these, these are groups which are formed, which are multi-stakeholder. So we're not talking about uh, seasoned diplomats and policymakers who are used to creating institutions and, and new structures, etc. We're talking about registries, registrars, business people, end users, NGOs, professors, etc. And they've done a an immense amount of work, I have to say. So now we have proposals for the three main components of INA, the numbers, the names, and uh, protocol parameters. There's still quite a few questions uh, that, that need to be answered, especially on the naming part, which is one of the more political, because n numbers and protocol parameters, you know, it, it's quite technical. So most people find it a bit boring, I think. Uh, names, where well, you can start you know, start, start fiddling through with, you know, what is a proper name and what safeguards you might associate with a name, etc., etc. So there's, there's still a few, a, few, a few questions left, but there's, there's been tremendous progress. The target date, rather than deadline, for completion of this process, for having a, uh, a proposal for a new governance structure, or oversight structure, I should say, is September this year, because that's the end of the current contract between the US government and I can for the performance of these INF functions. So it could be delayed a bit, and the contract could be extended a little bit if we need time, and it looks like we, we might need a bit more time. But the idea is that everybody's working to that date, and that by uh, around um, September, we should have the US government approve a proposal by the global multi stakeholder committee, so by all these working groups, for passing on their oversight of these key functions. And I should, I should have mentioned, I was not looking at my script, but there's a few conditions that the US government have uh, put on all this. They, uh, so four main conditions. They said that w they will approve uh, a new oversight mechanism only if it fulfills the following conditions. First, it should support and enhance the multi-stakeholder model. So it has to be something which is multi-stakeholder, and I'll come back to that in a minute. It needs to maintain the security, stability, and resiliency of the Internet's domain name system, which is probably the one condition you need. Well, we still want to have a domain name system that works, an IP numbering that works. It meets the needs and expectations of the global customers and partners of the INS services. That basically means, for like Barry, I guess, um, registries and registers, the people that basically are, direct, that are operating the domain names that depend on this INF function to work well, to do the proper amendments of directory in time and properly. And then it needs to maintain the openness of the internet. That's a bit fluffy. It's not actually openness of the internet in the sense of net neutrality. It's more um, that the idea that you know, any person connected to the internet should be able to talk to another person of the internet. They should, you, know, you should have a free flow of information and data, broadly speaking. They, they didn't really define it, but that's, that's the gist. And importantly, there's a condition which wasn't really in the list of four conditions, but it's actually probably the most interesting or the most important. They specified that they would not accept a proposal that replaces the US government's role 
with a government-led or an intergovernmental organization solution. So we're very clear. If it's not us, it's not going to be anyone else, and it's certainly not going to be a UN-type thing that others can overly influence or capture. That's the sort of subtext. So it's a very interesting uh, set of ideas, and as you can imagine, it's, it's creating a lot of buzz. There's a lot of governments watching this. Uh, a lot of governments that are uh, used to the UN system uh, and, and, and governments' top-down control that um, are not very familiar with the multi stakeholder model. A lot of them have, have um, increased their understanding of how it works and, and shifted and are far more uh, supportive of the multi stakeholder model, including uh, China, for instance, which, uh, which actually sent the Internet Minister to the London meeting of ICANN in June last year, who made a, an opening ceremony speech where he said that uh, China was dedicated to a global Internet and a multi stakeholder model which is uh, quite a, a, you know, an important move for a country that others might think might be much more UN-linked. Uh, There's still others in the world that uh, would be far more comfortable with a UN uh, set up. Uh, not actually so much the UN itself, funnily enough. I think they, they understand that they can work collaboratively with organizations such as ICANN and others. I think we've, uh, it's, it's a good place there, but there's a lot of geopolitical talk, again, related to the bigger question. So who controls the Internet? Well, if you control the Internet, or if you can, through certain setups, intergovernmental setups, for instance, control the Internet, then it might help your uh, political means elsewhere uh, at global level. So uh, it's all about a, a very technical evolution, but uh, which people are relating to uh, much bigger geopolitical uh, tracks. And you'll be lucky to hear, I'm, I'm coming to the end of it, but uh, very importantly, I've mentioned the target date of September, and that's where it becomes very interesting for Ireland. So, you know, there's a lot of attention now on this process, but there'll be even more as we come to the moment when a, a substantial proposal is, is agreed by this global stakeholder community, send it to the US government, and that hopefully the US government approves it and then it's launched to the world. So towards September next year, or certainly the autumn, we will be in a situation where we have an idea of what will replace the US government's historical oversight role over these core internet functions. And that happens to coincide with um, the holding of ICANN's... Um, ICANN holds three global meetings a year, and as it happens, we're holding uh, one in mid-October in Dublin. So uh, we're going to have, once again, the eyes of the world seriously watching Dublin. I'm not just saying that to, uh, to, to excite you, it's going to be the case. So um, people will be watching that meeting because it could be the one where either the solution is formally endorsed and or some of the final important tweaks are agreed. Um, so it will be a big meeting. Uh, Barry, do you know the exact date? Is it 19th? 19th. 19th to 22nd of October. For the week. So it will be basically a week of, of meetings here where we'll have um, probably just over 2,000 people, again from all these stakeholder groups, governments, civil society, business, etc., coming to Dublin. Normally do for an ICANN meeting, it's, it's about, you know, just ongoing working groups to talk about fairly boring stuff to most of the world, um, but stuff that ensured the good functioning of the internet. This time we've got this major new governance set up that will be somehow finalised. Um, so yeah, it's, it's going to be a big event in Dublin uh, later this year, which I'm really looking forward to. So, free to attend. So it is free to attend. I should, I should mention, absolutely, I should have made the... Yeah, I mean, ICANN meetings and, and all working groups are free to attend. They don't require any membership of any kind like that. It's open to anyone. So. If you're an academic, you've got a direct route. If you've got government, you've got a direct route, etc., etc., and it's all free. In the Dublin Convention Centre. And it will be in the beautiful Dublin Convention Centre, indeed. So I'll just, I'll just uh, sort of conclude with a few questions, just, just thinking about a, a bit of an international uh, affairs perspective, since since we're here uh, today at the IEA. Um, and I've sort of alluded to it. I think one of the questions to me is, how this multi-stakeholder model may not be relevant just for the internet sphere, but more widely for international affairs. And maybe not, as some have said in the past, to replace the traditional nation-state model, but maybe to give it a bit of a, on the contrary, a bit of a useful complement, a, a new breath of fresh air, if you will, that helps uh, address some of those new global transnational challenges in a novel manner, because we need to have 
all sorts of different actors present. You know, we, climate change is another one where we do need to have a stakeholders present around the table. You can't just have governments. And they're, they're doing that increasingly in UN summits on, around climate change. But often, stakeholders are not actually in the room. They might be reading a statement, maybe they're listening, but they're not around the table devising the policies and the procedures, which is the case in the internet world. So that's a bit of food for thought uh, here. Um, yeah, so could that be a, a bit of a, of a way to, uh, to avoid a clash of civilizations that we've been talking about for, for a few years? Well, certainly Samuel Hunt Huntington. Um, so I will leave it here. Um, as I said, I can talk about net neutrality and privacy in quite a bit of detail because I spent the last seven years of my life uh, at Skype uh, championing net neutrality when no one wanted to listen. Uh, and privacy, of course, is something that we all deal with. So I'll, uh, I'll close it there. Thank you again very much for having me.